I could issue a spoiler alert and say that this talk reveals the ending of Great Expectations. However, even those of you who think you know how the story ends may be left wondering by the end of this video, what happened next? Some innovative TV series like Black Mirror have come up with alternative endings to stories, and the same idea has been tried out when trying to complete the TV adaptation of Dickens' last unfinished novel, The Mystery of Edwin Drood. There was, however, one Dickens novel for which the author himself wrote at least three different endings, Great Expectations. Before I look at each of these in detail, I'd like you to ask yourself this question. What happens to Pip and Estella after the end of the novel? Do they part never to meet again? Do they remain friends and meet occasionally? Or do they marry and, for all we know, live happily or miserably ever after? Hmm. I suspect that opinion is divided about this, as the ending now found in most editions is deliberately ambiguous. My best guess, however, is that most of you will have opted for the romantic, happy ending. This was not, however, Dickens' original conception of how the tortured relationship between Pip and Estella was to be concluded, and which was intended to defy readers' expectations. As he wrote to his friend, confidant and future biographer John Forster, the general turn and tone of the working out and winding up will be away from all such things as they conventionally go. Dickens' original ending is not universally known, and only became public knowledge when it was published as a footnote to the third volume of John Forster's Life of Charles Dickens in 1874. So for those of you who are unfamiliar with it, what follows is the ending that Dickens originally wrote. The only point to clarify in advance is that Little Pip is the son of Joe and Biddy, and thus Old Pip's nephew. It was two years more before I saw herself. I had heard of her as leading a most unhappy life, and as being separated from her husband, who had used her with great cruelty, and who had become quite renowned as a compound of pride, brutality and meanness. I had heard of the death of her husband, from an accident consequent on ill-treating a horse, and of her being married again to a Shropshire doctor who, against his interest, had once very manfully intervened on an occasion when he was in professional attendance on Mr Drummle, and had witnessed some outrageous treatment of her. I had heard that the Shropshire doctor was not rich, and that they lived on her personal fortune. I was in England again, in London, and walking along Piccadilly with Little Pip, when a servant came running after me to ask would I step back to a lady in a carriage who wished to speak to me. It was a little pony carriage which the lady was driving, and the lady and I looked sadly enough on one another. I'm greatly changed, I know, but I thought you would like to shake hands with Estella too, Pip. Lift up that pretty child and let me kiss it. She supposed the child, I think, to be my child. I was very glad afterwards to have had the interview, for in her face and in her voice and in her touch she gave me the assurance that suffering had been stronger than Miss Havisham's teaching and had given her a heart to understand what my heart used to be. That unconventional ending to the novel in manuscript was shared by Dickens with a few close friends, including John Forster and the popular novelist Bulwer Lytton. Lytton objected to it as being both too sad and too similar to the ending of Lever's A Day's Ride, the serialisation of which in all the year round had only just finished. Uncharacteristically, Dickens heeded the advice and completely rewrote the ending to the novel, omitting all the material I've just quoted except for Pip's knowledge that Estella's first and only husband had died after mistreating a horse. Instead of the encounter in Piccadilly, Pip returns to the grounds of Satis House after an 11 year absence from England, and there, by an extraordinary coincidence, encounters Estella, who's taking leave of her childhood home, which she now owns, but which is being sold as a building plot. In the rewritten ending as it appeared in All the Year Round, the closing words of the manuscript are now spoken by Estella, 
who says that suffering has been stronger than all other teaching and has taught me to understand what your heart used to be. They agree to be friends and, in Estella's final words, will continue friends apart. The narrator negotiates the couple's departure from the blighted Eden of their childhood with this moving and enigmatic sentence. I took her hand in mine and we went out of the ruined place. And as the morning mists had risen long ago when I first left the forge, so the evening mists were rising now. And in all the broad expanse of tranquil light they showed to me, I saw the shadow of no parting from her. Now, I don't know about you, but I've always found that final clause puzzling and, frankly, incomprehensible. In the broad expanse of tranquil light, what is casting a shadow? No parting. How can you see the shadow of no parting? In the much emended manuscript, Dickens wrote two more words which he crossed through before sending the final instalment off to the printers. So that in that abandoned version, the last line would have read, I saw the shadow of no parting from her, but one. That was a clear reference to the marriage service of the Church of England, in which the couple vow to remain together till death us do part. Dickens struck out those two words, though, as the allusion was both too obvious and an unwanted oblique invocation of death, when what he intended to suggest was futurity rather than finality. But even that rewritten ending didn't quite satisfy the author, and the final clause, as it appeared in the serialisation and the first edition, underwent yet another transformation when it appeared in the first one-volume edition of 1862 and most subsequent editions where it now reads, I saw no shadow of another parting from her. This revision is perhaps slightly clearer, but to my mind at least, not much. No words of love have been exchanged, let alone rings or vows. But Charlie Dickens, writing a new preface in 1892, had no hesitation in declaring that the whole intention and plan of the book are to a very great extent spoilt by the marriage of Pip and Estella. On that basis alone, we have to credit the Victorians with being dashed good at reading between, or rather beyond, the lines. Critics of Great Expectations have wrestled with the variant endings for 150 years now, and fall into three broad camps. There are those, including Forster, Charlie Dickens and George Bernard Shaw, who prefer the original, clearly unhappy ending, on the grounds that it is consistent with the rest of the novel, neither exonerating Miss Havisham nor rewarding Pip and Estella. More recently, cogent arguments have been put forward in favour of one or other of the endings at Satie's house. Estella has been chastened and somehow softened by experience. Pip has performed his penance, exiled in Egypt, and now, older and wiser, deserves a chance of happiness. Finally, there are the neither nors, who maintain that Dickens botched the ending of the novel as he couldn't decide what to do with Pip. Let's now consider the dilemma facing Dickens in the early summer of 1861 as he approached the end of his novel. Miss Havisham and Magwitch were both dead. Pip's expectations are dashed. Joe and Biddy are happily married. Estella is unhappily married to Bentley Drummle. Pip goes abroad to put his life in order, returning after 11 years to what? Dickens was at that time writing not only to the deadline of serialisation in a weekly magazine, but also to a very tight word limit. He knew that his novel had to end on August the 3rd, and he had no more than a thousand words in which to tie up the loose ends. His initial inclination was to leave Pip a sadder, wiser bachelor. Estella's plans miscarry, and we are left with an elegiac ending, regretting what might have been. In that original ending, we see Dickens the artist, the moralist and the realist, 
resisting the temptation to pen a saccharine ending, so characteristic of his early fiction. But then Bulwer-Lytton reminded him of his duty to the reading public. They didn't want moralising, they wanted to be uplifted, taken out of themselves by the prospect of romance. If Pip and Estella both really did mature and change for the better, then that transformation should be rewarded, otherwise there would be no incentive for self-improvement. What's more, this weekly serial was being turned into a three-volume novel for the circulating libraries, the standard and successful formula for which was the and reader, I married him, happy ending. However, Dickens couldn't bring himself to write such a trite conclusion explicitly, and instead veiled the outcome of the chance or destined meeting between Pip and Estella in opaque and ambiguous terms. Dickens' own comments on the revised endings indicate that he was unenthusiastic about the pretty little piece of writing he had produced, describing the story as more acceptable for the alteration and stating in lukewarm terms that, upon the whole, I think it is for the better. If Pip were truly the teller of his tale, he would surely know whether he married Estella or not, but the coyness in making any such assertion is down to the author. Unable to acquiesce completely to the demands of the marketplace and determined to at least keep the reader guessing. Hmm. Finally, let's not overlook the role of Marcus Stone in creating an ending to this novel. Stone was Dickens' choice to provide the first visual representations of scenes from the novel for the illustrated library edition of Great Expectations. I've already discussed Marcus Stone's unsatisfactory work in another video, but the one artistically competent plate he did produce, and the illustration which the publishers chose as the frontispiece to the book, depicts Pip and Estella sharing an intimate moment under a starry sky and bears the caption, with Estella, after all. This image can only be based on an interpretation of the last clause of the novel, over which Dickens struggled so badly, striving for uncertainty and ambiguity. And almost in defiance of that authorial intention, Stone supplied a ready-made interpretation of the ending, visible to the intending reader before they had even begun the novel, telling them at the outset that there would be a happy ending. So now, which ending do you prefer? One of Dickens's or your own? You decide and let me know in the comments below. Pip Pip and Estella love her. Love her. Love her.